This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week we honor the year in music for 1991, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1991. We also look at the case for putting Motorhead into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Grammy Hall of Fame and Museum in Los Angeles, California. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1991. In music, the way that music charts were formulated changed in 1991 as Billboard magazine started using the Nielsen SoundScan computer software in order to get a more accurate version of what was selling and to make it less corruptible. At least until the record labels and artists started to game the system by doing things like giving away their albums with the purchase of a cell phone or some other product. There were still problems with this whole software system at first. For instance, the Tower Records music chain stores, which were pretty popular at the time, did not use the same software as everybody else, which skewed the numbers until every store chain got on the same page. Three people were killed during an audience crush at an ACDC concert in 1991. Hollywood's famous recording studio, the Record Plant Studio, closed down. The first Lollapalooza tour was also held in 1991. Aerosmith, Janet Jackson, and the Rolling Stones all signed mega-million-dollar recording contracts. And Christian contemporary music broke through in 1991, as artists Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant both had hit albums. The biggest album of the year was Metallica's Black Album. Other big albums that year were Natalie Cole's Unforgettable with Love, Michael Jackson's Dangerous, Simply Red's Stars, the KLF's The White Room, Dire Straits on Every Street, Ozzy Osbourne's No More Tears, Brian Adams' Waking Up the Neighbors, Prince's Diamonds and Pearls, the soundtrack to the Disney animated movie Beauty and the Beast, along with Queen's final album while Freddie Mercury was still alive, Innuendo along with Michael Bolton's Time, Love, and Tenderness, which became the first CD to cross the $20 list price threshold. The biggest song that year was the theme song from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Brian Adams' classic, Everything I Do, I Do It For You and Only You and a couple million dollars. Anyway, Whitney Houston sang one of the most memorable versions of the Star Spangled Banner during that year's Super Bowl. Her version was released as a single and became a huge hit as people were caught up in the patriotic fever since the Gulf War had just started only a week or so earlier than the Super Bowl. Other hit songs of 1991 include I Want to Sex You Up from Color Me Bad, CNC Music Factory is going to make you sweat, everybody dance now. Paula Abdul's Rush Rush, One More Try from Timmy T. Unbelievable from EMF, Extreme with More Than Words, High Fives, I Like the Way, The First Time from Surface, and Baby Baby from Amy Grant. Janet Jackson became the first artist to have seven songs from the same album, in this case Rhythm Nation, to make it to the top five of the Billboard singles chart. In rock music, even though the biggest album of the year overall was Metallica's Black Album, Nirvana's Nevermind and Grunge officially broke through to the mainstream as Pearl Jam also released their album 10 and Soundgarden released Bad Motorfinger. The Seattle Sound, as grunge was originally called, also was the final nail in the coffin of the hair band and hard rock era as going forward, bands like Loverboy, Rat, and Cinderella started to lose favor with the public, at least until 80s nostalgia kicked in during the past 5-10 years or so. Def Leppard released the album Adrenalize, which was the last successful gasp from the hair band era. Guns N' Roses actually landed the first punch to hair bands with their earlier album, Appetite for Destruction, in 1987, 
but helped to finish off corporate hard rock bands with their 1991 albums, Use Your Illusions 1 and 2, which both came out on the exact same day. This isn't to say that metal was dead, not by a long shot. Heavy metal just moved overseas, with bands from the Scandinavian countries becoming popular, bands like Suffocation and Entombed. Alternative rock also started to take off, as R.E.M. released Out of Time, The Smashing Pumpkins released Gish, Toad the Wet Sprocket released Fear, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers released Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Garth Brooks became a megastar with the album Rope in the Wind, helping to move pop country to the forefront uh, for pretty much the entire 1990s. Other big albums included Don't Rock the Jukebox by Alan Jackson, It's All About to Change by Travis Tritt, For My Broken Heart by Reba McIntyre, Pocket Full of Gold by Vince Gill, Don't Go Near the Water by Sammy Kershaw, Heroes by Paul Overstreet, Brand New Man by Brooks and Dunn, Aces by Susie Boggess, and What Do I Do With Me from Miss Tanya Tucker. On the singles chart for country music, Garth Brooks had four number one songs with Unanswered Prayers, The Thunder Rolls, Shameless, and Two of a Kind Working on a Full House. George Strait had three number ones with You Know Me Better Than That, If I Know Me, and I've Come to Expect It From You. Brooks and Dunn had two number one songs with Brand New Man and My Next Broken Heart. Alternative rap took hold, beginning with Tribe Called Quest's Low End Theory and continuing with classic rap albums from Gangstar and De La Soul in hip-hop. 80s hip-hop superstars Public Enemy came out with their last big album, Apocalypse 91, The Enemy Strikes Black. MC Light, Queen Latifah, and Naughty by Nature also released hit albums in 1991. Big songs from the year included The Ghetto Boys' Minds Playing Tricks on Me. A Tribe Called Quest checked the rhyme and also scenario with the leaders of the new school. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince's classic Summertime. Naughty by Nature's OPP. Ice T's original Gangster. Black Sheep's The Choice Is Yours. Cypress Hill's How I Could Just Kill a Man. Main Source's Live at the Barbecue. And De La Soul's Millie Pulled a Pistol on Santa. In dance music, DJ Magazine, which was a reboot of the magazine Jocks, started publication in 1991. They didn't have their top 100 DJs list at that point, but they did have a top three. Those DJs were Danny Rampling, Graham Park, and Mike Pickering. Trip Hop made its debut of sorts, at least in the mainstream, when Massive Attack released their album Blue Lines. The Prodigy also released their first single, Charlie. Legendary DJ Carl Cox burst onto the dance charts for the first time with I Want You. The city of Frankfurt, Germany became the capital of trance music for a time, as producers like Resistance D brought their spin to a dance genre that was beginning to find its way to a wider audience. Eurodance held its own with hit songs from artists like Black Box, Crystal Waters, Enigma, London Beat, Latour, The KLF, Karina, and Stereo MCs. It would be about another 20 years or so before electronic dance music completely exploded and became the dominant genre of the 2010s. However, pop dance, as it was known back then, did very well in 1991 with dance hits by D. Light, Madonna, Mariah Carey, Kathy Dennis, PM Dawn, CNC Music Factory, Prince, and Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. Even U2 stepped into the electronica era with their EDM-infused album, Octung Baby. Luis Miguel brought Boleros back to the mainstream in the 1990s with his album Romance. Other Latin music artists who were big in 1991 included Ana Gabriel, Miriam Hernand, Juan Gabriel, Cheyenne, also Daniela Romo, Bronco, Maz, Selena y Los Dinos, and Luis Miguel. Musicals or revivals of musicals that were around in 1991 included The Will Rogers Follies, Forbidden Broadway, Volume 2, Phantom, The Secret Garden, and Children of Eden. 
Musical movies and documentaries that were released in 1991 included For the Boys, The Five Heartbeats, Stepping Out, The Commitments, The Animated Movies, An American Tale, Five Goes West, Rockadoodle, Rover Dangerfield, The Magic Riddle, and Beauty and the Beast, and also Madonna's tour documentary, Truth or Dare. Bands that formed in 1991 included Two Unlimited, Ablogic, Black Street, Belly, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Counting Crows, The Chemical Brothers, Cake, House of Pain, Luscious Jackson, The Muffs, Oasis, Painkiller, Pete Rock and CL Smooth, Power Man 5000, Primitive Radio Gods, Rage Against the Machine, Utah Saints, and 3-6 Mafia. Bands that broke up before, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus in 1991 included the two live crew, Alias, Animal Logic, Bad English, Big Pig, Edie Burkell and the New Bohemians, Devo, D.O., N.W.A., Y.N.T., Modern English, The Traveling Wilburys, Transvision Vamp, Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam, Talk Talk, Talking Heads, Throwing Muses, Stetsa Sonic, Bruce Hornsby and the Range, and the Fat Boys. The Knack and Procol Harum reformed in 1991 as well. Artists who were born in 1991 included Ed Sheeran, Carol G., Louis Tomlinson of One Direction, Charlie Puth, Jesse Nelson, and Leanne Pinnock, both of the group Little Mix, Anne Marie, and rappers DaBaby, Offset, Quavo, Young Thug, NF, Fetty Wap, Moneybag Yo, PNB Rock, and Tyler the Creator. November 24th of 1991 was the date that Freddie Mercury of Queen passed away from complications of AIDS and Eric Carr of Kiss passed away from cancer. Legendary festival promoter Bill Graham was killed in a helicopter crash in 1991. Also passing away in 1991 was Eric Clapton's son who fell out of a window in New York City. His passing became the subject of Clapton's hit single, Tears in Heaven. Seven members of Reba McIntyre's touring band passed away in a plane crash. Other musical artists who passed away in 1991 included Steve Clark from Def Leppard from Alcoholism, jazz trumpet player Buck Clayton, composer Ernst Krennic, singer and actor Yves Montand, singer Mort Schumann, musician Andres Panufnik, Singer Tennessee Ernie Ford, musician Ole Beach, singer Roy Black, jazz great Miles Davis, singer Dottie West, violinist Zeno Francescati, jazz saxophonist Charlie Barnett, pianist Claudio Ara, jazz saxophonist Stan Getz, Temptations singer David Ruffin, singer Gene Clark, Egyptian singer Mohammed Abdel Wahab, composer Carmine Coppola, guitarist Johnny Thunders, musician Steve Marriott, composer Doc Pomus, guitar maker Leo Fender, French singer Serge Gainsbourg, lyricist Howard Ashman, and singer and actor Renato Raskel. In award ceremonies for the music of 1991, at the Grammy Awards, Natalie Cole won three of the four major awards, including Album of the Year for Unforgettable with Love and Song and Record of the Year for her duet with her father, Nat King Cole, digitally that is, since he had passed away about 20 some odd years earlier. The song they did together, quote unquote, was Unforgettable. Mark Cohen, whose big hit that year was Walking in Memphis, won Best New Artist. At the American Music Awards, the big winners were Color Me Bad, CNC Music Factory, Michael Bolton, Paula Abdul, Luther Vandross, Garth Brooks, Reba McIntyre, and Brian Adams. At the Billboard Music Awards, Mariah Carey was Artist of the Year. At the MTV Video Music Awards, R.E.M. won Video of the Year for the song Losing My Religion. Luther Vandross won Album of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. Garth Brooks and Reba McIntyre won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Rome, Italy, Carola from Sweden won for the song Fine God of en Stormwind. 
Garth Brooks won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and he also won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Seal won Best British Album for his self-titled debut album, and Queen won Best Song for These Are the Days of Our Lives at the Brit Awards. Brian Adams won Entertainer of the Year at the Juno Awards. Baby Animals won Album of the Year for their self-titled album. And Yothu Yindi won Song of the Year for Treaty Filthy Lucra Remix at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, the Will Rogers Follies won Best Musical and Fiddler on the Roof won Best Revival of a Musical. At the Academy Awards for the Music for 1991, in those categories, the movie Beauty and the Beast won Best Score for Alan Menken, and also they won Best Song for its self-titled theme song. The Pulitzer Prize that year was won by Shulamit Ran for the piece Symphony for the Pulitzer Prize in Music. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame held its induction ceremony for its class of 1991 on January 16th at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. The mood of the ceremony, though, was overshadowed by the start of the Gulf War, which started while the ceremony was actually going on with an attack on the city of Baghdad in Iraq. In fact, during that night's attack, CNN, then a fledgling cable news network that some people knew about, were one of the few news outlets who were broadcasting the attack live from a Baghdad rooftop. It turned CNN into must-see TV. Even people at the ceremony were trying to find televisions to watch. That night was the unofficial night that the 24-7 news cycle became a thing as people were glued to their television sets as the war unfolded, making CNN very famous. During the ceremony, the hall inducted record executive Nasui Erdogan into the non-performers category. Band leader Dave Bartholomew and record producer Ralph Bass were inducted into the non-performers category. Howlin' Wolf was inducted into the Early Influencers category. And in the Performers category, the Hall inducted John Lee Hooker, Laverne Baker, The Birds, The Impressions, Jimmy Reed, Ike and Tina Turner, and this next artist. Wilson Pickett was born the fourth out of 11 children on March 18, 1941, in Prattville, Alabama. His musical interest, like a lot of singers, was born in the church, in this case by singing in the choir at a very young age. He didn't get along with his mother, and since his parents had split up, he went to live with his father in Detroit when he was 14. And it was in the Detroit churches and walking around on the streets of Detroit where Wilson honed his craft, picking up on the musical styles of great rock and roll artists like Little Richard, who Wilson cited as having a huge influence on him. At the age of 14, Wilson joined the gospel group The Violin Airs, for four years at least. Much like other gospel singers, though, Wilson found another calling, so he decided to leave the Violin Airs and join the secular singing group The Falcons in 1959. That other calling, by the way, you might ask? Well, money because secular singing groups were making a lot more of it than gospel music groups. Money, money, money. Wilson and other gospel singers like James Brown, Aretha Franklin, and Sam Cooke all made the switch to singing secular music. What they didn't realize was that by bringing the gospel music to secular music, they were helping to create a whole new genre of music, rhythm and blues, or soul music, if you will. During Pickett's time with the Falcons, he co-wrote the hit I Found a Love, which he re-recorded as a solo artist later. While he was with the Falcons, Wilson worked on solo demos in hopes of getting a solo contract. And one of his demo tracks, If You Need Me, was given to famous producer Jerry Wexler, who was working at Atlantic Records, by Wilson himself, actually, in hopes of landing a recording contract. Jerry Wexler instead gave the demo to recording artist Solomon Burke, who was Atlantic Records' biggest selling artist up to that point. Burke recorded the song for himself, which became one of Burke's biggest hits. 
In short, Wilson Pickett kind of had his own song stolen out from underneath him, although he would eventually record it himself and turn it into a decent hit. Wilson instead signed a contract with Double L Records and recorded a few songs which became hits. Among those was It's Too Late, which went to number seven on the R&B charts. Wilson's streak of hits with Double L got Atlantic Records to buy Wilson's contract, and for some strange reason, Wilson went with Atlantic despite the fact that Jerry Wexler kind of did Wilson dirty. It turned out in the end pretty okay, as you will see. His first two singles with Atlantic, I'm Gonna Cry and Come Home Baby, didn't do too much. His third single, In the Midnight Hour, became his first huge single. Recorded at Stax Record Studios in Memphis, Tennessee, and released in 1965, Midnight Hour went to number 21 on the American Pop Singles Chart, number 1 on the American R&B Chart, sold over a million copies, and earned Wilson a Grammy Award nomination. Wilson's sessions at Stax Studios produced three more popular singles. Don't Fight It, 6345789 Soulsville, USA, and 99 and a half won't do. Then the new owner of Stax Records label, Jim Stewart, decided that he wanted his recording studio to be used by his artists only. So, Atlantic Records had to go elsewhere to record, since they were only renting studio space there. That somewhere else, by the way, was Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. For Wilson, that place was magic, as he recorded some of his biggest hits in their studios, like Mustang Sally, Land of a Thousand Dances, and Funky Broadway. He also was backed up by some of the best studio musicians around, guys like drummer Roger Hawkins, bassist Tommy Cogbill, keyboardist Spooner Oldman, and guitarist Jimmy Johnson. From the end of 1967 to 1969, Wilson shuffled back and forth between recording in Memphis and Muscle Shoals. He worked with guys like guitarist and Allman Brothers band member Dwayne Allman and bassist Jerry Jemmett. He recorded hits that were written by Bobby Womack, The Beatles, and Roger Collins. He ended 1969 by going to Miami, Florida, where he recorded chart-making cover versions of The Supremes' You Keep Me Hanging On and The Archie Sugar Sugar. 1970 saw him working with the iconic duo Gamble and Huff up in Philadelphia for his next album, Wilson Pickett in Philadelphia, because why not have an album called that if you're in Philadelphia, I guess. I wonder how many hours were actually spent coming up with that title, by the way. Anyway, at least the album got him a couple of hits, specifically Engine Number 9 and Don't Let the Green Grass Fool You. After that, the much-traveled Mr. Pickett went back to Muscle Shoals to record some more hits. Don't Knock My Love Part 1, which was his last number one hit on the R&B charts. Call My Name, I'll Be There, and Fire and Water. Then in 1972, he went over to Ghana, the country that is, to perform at a celebration for Ghana's Independence Day, and then came back to put together some tracks for another Atlantic Records album. Somewhere along that line, though, while making the new album, he left Atlantic Records for RCA Records, despite having another hit song at that time on Atlantic called Funk Factory. Atlantic, under their subsidiary Big Tree, released Wilson's final record with the label in 1978, a few years after he had actually finished it. Even though Wilson scored some R&B hits in 1973 and 1974, like Take a Closer Look at the Woman You're With, Mr. Magic Man, Soft Soul, Boogie Woogie, and International Playboy, he wasn't crossing over to the pop charts like he used to. And because of that, RCA dropped him from the label in 1975. He bounced around to a couple of other record labels, including getting his own record label. But he really never had another hit that was his recording, at least, after 1974. 
It didn't help that he developed a heavy cocaine habit to go along with his violent nature and alcoholism. In 1991, he was arrested for driving drunk and making threats to the mayor of Englewood, New Jersey, by driving over and wrecking the mayor's lawn while he was drunk. And while that event was considered kind of funny, especially with some people wanting to do the exact same thing to their own politicians on occasion, the next two events were not even remotely funny. In 1992... Wilson Pickett hit an 86-year-old man with his car. Police found empty vodka bottles and beer cans in his car. That man died later in the year. Wilson was charged only with drunk driving, was ordered to go to rehab, serve one year in prison, and five years probation. One week after he hit the pedestrian, he was accused by his living girlfriend of threatening her and throwing a vodka bottle at her. The judge only ordered him to stay away from his girlfriend. In 1996, he was arrested for assaulting another girlfriend at the time, this time while under the influence of cocaine. The girlfriend declined to press charges against him. Despite all of that, a couple of things started to happen for Wilson. The first was that a lot of his hits that he wrote were being discovered by a new generation of artists. Artists such as Van Halen, Aerosmith, The Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, Roxy Music, among many others, started recording his hits, making them popular all over again. He also started to become an elder statesman of sorts and an icon in soul music. He released a 1999 comeback album, It's Harder Now, for which he received a Grammy Award nomination. His music was a big part of the 1991 popular movie, The Commitments. He also appeared in the 1998 sequel to the Blues Brothers movie called Blues Brothers 2000, which didn't actually do all that well at the box office. Wilson Pickett spent the rest of the 1990s and early 2000s touring and receiving accolades. At the end of 2004, he decided to take the next year off of touring to concentrate on his health and to work on a gospel album. Unfortunately, he ended up spending 2005 in and out of hospitals. And on January 19, 2006, Wilson Pickett had a heart attack while living in Ashburn, Virginia. He passed away in a hospital in Reston, Virginia. His body was taken to Louisville, Kentucky, where he was buried. His good friend, Little Richard, gave the eulogy. While he was alive, Wilson Pickett released 21 studio albums, three live albums, and seven compilation albums. Of those, 15 hit the top 40 on the American R&B charts, with eight of those hitting the top 10. On the American pop charts, two hit the top 40 with 1966's The Exciting Wilson Pickett, charting the highest at number 21. Wilson also released 59 singles. Of those, 40 hit the top 40 on the American R&B charts, with 18 of those 40 hitting the top 10, including five that hit number one. On the American pop charts, 15 hit the top 40, with two of those 15 hitting the top 10, 1967's Funky Broadway, which hit number 8, and 1966's Land of a Thousand Dances, which hit number 6. Overseas, only seven of his songs hit the top 40, with none of them getting to the top 10. Wilson was nominated for five Grammy Awards, winning none of them. He was inducted into the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame in 2005, the National Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame in 2015, while his 1965 song, In the Midnight Hour, was inducted into the Library of Congress National Recording Registry in 2016. Presented for induction by Bobby Brown of New Edition and also solo fame, Wilson Pickett, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991, and we have put a selection of his music onto this week's music podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. 
The Music History in Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This week, we're going to look at the case for putting London, England's own heavy metal pioneers, Motorhead, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As we always do, to the tale of the tape we go. Motorhead released 23 studio albums, 16 live albums, including their classic No Sleep Till Hammersmith, 16 compilation albums, 3 box sets, and 5 EPs. Of those, 17 hit the top 40 in the UK, including 6 that hit the top 10. That includes No Sleep Till Hammersmith, which hit number 1. In America, only their 2013 album Aftershock and their 2015 album Bad Magic went top 40. They also released 29 singles. Of those, only the 2016 reissue of Ace of Spades made the American charts going to number 12. In the UK, six went top 40 with the 1991 live version of the song Motorhead off of No Sleep Till Hammersmith going top 10, getting as high as number six. Motorhead was nominated for four Grammy Awards, winning one in 2005 for Best Metal Performance. Their must-have albums to put into your collection include Bomber, Overkill, No Sleep Till Hammersmith, and probably their most famous album, Ace of Spades. Also, if you're a fan of professional wrestling, then you already know that Motorhead also did wrestler Triple H's entrance song, The Game. I am the game. That's a great song. Anyway, England had a lot of economic struggles in the 1970s. The country had high unemployment, especially the youth. There was a lot of social unrest with riots and strikes all the time. The new heavy metal movement came from all this strife. Groups like Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, and such. Motorhead came from that era and those times. And led by Lemmy, the group were ranked at number 26 on VH1's Greatest Artists of a Hard Rock list. And they influenced thrash metal, punk rock, and speed metal, along with tons of bands like Slayer, Anthrax, and Metallica. Motorhead have actually been eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since 2003, but were only nominated for the Rock Hall in 2020. They did not make the final cut. Personally, that's just wrong. I feel that the Hall was definitely wrong to overlook them that year and pretty much every single year since 2003. So here is hoping that they finally do the right thing and put Motorhead in into this upcoming class of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they definitely deserve it. And to prove it, we have also put their music onto this week's music podcast playlist. And like I said before, the link is in the show notes. This week's Spotlight Music Hall of Fame is the Grammy Museum and Hall of Fame in Los Angeles, California. There are actually three Grammy museums now, with one in Newark, New Jersey, and the other in Cleveland, Mississippi, to go with the one in L.A. The Recording Academy runs the museums, but has been inducting members into its Hall of Fame since 1974. The main Grammy Museum itself, with its Hall of Fame wing, opened in 2008 at L.A. Live, which is the downtown L.A. complex that has the Staples Center, now called the Crypto Dog something, or who knows? They always change these stupid names. Anyway, the museum has four floors, including a theater. Some of the past exhibits there have paid tribute to John Lennon, Roy Orbison, Latin singer Jenny Rivera, and the world of hip-hop. Plus, they have ticketed evening discussions with artists such as Debbie Gibson. 
ticket prices are $18 for adults, $15 for seniors and military members with ID, $12 for college students with ID, and kids 5 through 17. Children 4 and under and museum members are free. Its normal hours of operation are Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m., and closed on Tuesdays. However, always check with the museum's website to see if and when it is open as their time shift depending on the season and on the events, seeing as how there are a lot of events at the Staples slash Crypto Doggy Dog Dog whatever the stupid name of the stadium is these days. Really, just buy yourself a new stadium with a name and call it the Grammy Stadium or something. Anyway, grammymuseum.org is its website. Just a personal gripe. Sorry. Let's go to the year 2008. The Grammy Museum inducted eight albums and seven singles into its Hall of Fame that year. The genres spread from opera to jazz to classical music. There were only four songs you would consider pop or anything even remotely modern. There's the song Alfie from Dionne Warwick, Dead Man's Curve from Jan and Dean, Breezin from George Benson, and Janice Ian's classic At Seventeen. In the opera category, there was a recording done by the RCA Victor Orchestra, conducted by Fritz Reiner and the Robert Shaw Chorale, which was conducted by, well, Robert Shaw. The recording was on the RCA Red Seal label and was recorded in 1951. The opera itself has a rather controversial story concerning its creation. In 1875, this opera was first performed after the controversy surrounding it almost derailed the performance. The opera is about a gypsy girl who seduces an army corporal named Don Jose, who was engaged at the time. Uh Uh-oh, there's a big problem right there. So after being seduced by this girl, Don Jose helps the girl escape trouble with the cops, only to be put in jail himself. First off, if you're being seduced by a girl, I think that's kind of on you at the same time. It wasn't really the girl's fault at all. It was actually kind of a mutual thing. Just saying. Anyway, Don Jose then deserts the army in order to be with this girl. And as with every great love story, uh, the girl kicks Don Jose to the side for a bullfighter. It's kind of how it works, people. Sorry. Don Jose, of course, can't handle it. I mean, it is an opera after all. So he kills her by stabbing her. Ain't love awesome? Also, why is it that every great love story ends up with somebody dead? What is up with that? Looking at you, Shakespeare, you started it. Anyway, that's kind of where the controversy kicks in. See, the Opera Comique in Paris, where the opera was supposed to be staged, was known for family-friendly productions. Doing one where someone gets killed was not really going to fly all that well. Members of the production's leadership got into a heated battle over it, and it got to the point where one of them quit because the composer was not going to change that script one single bit. The scandal was so hot that big actresses of the day wouldn't even try out for the part of the main character. It was that toxic a controversy. Finally, on March 3rd, 1875, the opera premiered. At first, it was met with halfway decent reviews. However, like everything else, as time went on, people began to warm up to the opera, and eventually it became a classic including being inducted into the Grammy Museum Hall of Fame. The composer, unfortunately, didn't live long enough to see his opera become successful because, well, he had a heart attack, and he died only 30 performances into the opera's run, unfortunately. Guess all that stress from the controversy finally caught up with him. Mm. The composer, by the way, well, that would be George Bizet. 
and his opera about the seductive gypsy girl who ends up getting knifed at the end? Well, that opera is called Carmen, and that premiered in France on March 3, 1875, and a 1951 recording of the opera, as performed by the RCA Victor Orchestra and the Robert Shaw Chorale, was inducted into the Hall of Fame of the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles, California, in 2008. And we have also put this recording onto this week's podcast music playlist. The link, like I've said a couple of times already, is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>